Γεια σας. Θα ήθελα να καλωσορίσουμε το καθηγητή Bill Καπράλος που μας έρχεται από το Ontario Institute of Technology να μας μιλήσει για Serious Gaming σε Medical Applications. Ο Bill είναι Associate Professor στο Πανεπιστήμιο στο Τορόντο. Έχει πάρει πολλά awards από την IBM, από την Google, από, τα, από το Research Council του Καναδά και ασχολείται πάνω σε θέματα immersive technologies, serious gaming, multimodal virtual environments, auditory event, events and 3D spatial awareness. Άρα το καλωσορίζουμε που ήρθατε να μας δώσει αυτή την ομιλία και τον ευχαριστούμε. Ευχαριστώ Ευχαριστώ και ευχαριστώ Κατερίνα που, με, που, μας, που μου έδωσε το invitation να ανοιχθώ εδώ. And I think I'm going to talk in English as of now. Um, I can talk Greek, obviously, but my technical Greek is probably not too good, so I would be doing you a disservice if I gave my presentation in Greek. Um, so, ευχαριστώ που ήρθατε. And so, as Κατερίνα mentioned, Bill Kapralos, I'm at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. And I've been there for about 12 years. And it's, it's a fairly new university, it's about 14 or 15 years old. And the nice thing, it is, I guess you, it's equivalent or similar to what you have here. It is an engineering focused school, um, engineering and technology in general. And everything we do is, is you know, tech oriented. Um, and I'm actually in the program, my background is computer science and virtual reality, um, spatial, uh, auditory spatial modeling in particular. And over the past 12 years, I've moved into you know, virtual simulation and gaming in particular uh, for education, a medical education. So who here plays games? Who doesn't play, maybe that's what I should ask, who doesn't play games? I never said video games, I just said games, right? Everyone's played games and, and everyone plays games, but video games, so most of you play video games. Who likes video games and who, who who here has actually made a video game? Okay, some of you. Okay. Well, if you take up the course, then maybe you'll you'll start making video games. Um, so I was quite impressed. I mean, there was some. I'm asking because there there was some really good. I just saw a, a trailer of some of the work that's been done um, by her students here at the Polytechnic, and it, it was it was quite impressive. And I'm actually in a game development program in camp in at my university. It's a program dedicated to game development. And of course, it's not all, you know, it's not a, it, there's a lot of hard work in, in creating a game. It's very easy to look at a game and think, oh, that's, you know, basic. But there's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of physics involved and, and, and thinking and, and what have you. Um, and it was uh, one of the first gaming programs in Canada. Um, and, you know, the, the students are really, really motivated about games. And they love games. And it's very clear that they love games. So they do some really cool work. I'm going to show some of the, the work, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and then I'll show, I'll give you some examples of some of the work that my graduate students have done um, with respect to gaming for medical education. And I guess I'll, I'll just jump into the, uh, the presentation. So I'll start off by introducing and motivating the topic, talk about play and games, um, move into immersive tech, immersive technologies, um, show some examples of my work. And then, you know, I'll, I'll end with some things to consider, some open areas, uh, open problems that need to be addressed. And of course, problems creates opportunities for you guys in here, right? You guys are students. Who's, you guys are all engineering, I take it? So there's actually a lot of opportunities in, I'll say, the gaming world. And, you know, gaming, simulation, virtual reality. It's an up-and-coming air wall. It is, it is already... Um, it's a big field, but it's, it's growing. And in, me in medicine, in medical education, and in uh, you know, health and well-being in general, there's a lot of opportunities. And, and there's a lot of opportunities for students like you that are sitting here, um, you know, graduating in a year or two, perhaps, and, and looking for work. So there's, there's good opportunities here. So just a little bit about my university, as I pointed out. It's a relatively new, uh, um, new institution. Uh, there's about 10,000 students university-wide, and it's about 15 years old. And again, the, the focus is technology engineering. Um, it's a nice campus when there's no snow. It's, you know, the summer in Canada is very nice, but 
the winter is not so nice. I mean, I wish I could come here in the winter. Um, who's been to Canada? Okay. okay. What city? Waterloo. Waterloo? Waterloo? Well, yeah, Waterloo. Vancouver. Vancouver. Oh, nice. Vancouver is like probably the nicest city in Canada. But, um, so, you know, you should, you know, if, if you do visit, you're welcome to come to the university. Um, but of course, go in the summer or, or in the spring, you know, avoid the winter. Oh, although you may like the winter if you, if you like snow or you may think you like snow. Then, <laughs> come for one year and then ask, and then I'll ask you if you want to come a second year. Um, so, I don't like the snow if, if you can already tell. Um, so before, before starting off, I, wanna, I, I like starting, I'm going to start my talk by, you know, basically have you consider two things. Um, this whole thing about the medium affecting the message debate, and you know, Socrates, he complained that learning to write would diminish the memory capacity of his students. So in other words, at the time, you know, going back several thousand years ago, technology, state of the art was, you know, some form of writing utensil. Right, so you're writing things down, and at the time, Socrates he thought that would you know do harm to his students or, or limit their, their their memory capacity. Um, and so again, it's this fear of technology, and you know I'll use you know the, the present day analogy is gaming, and maybe not so much now, but at least in the past when I started working in the gaming field and using games for tech uh, for for education. There was this real fear of, of games, and, and everyone thought it was nonsense and you know a waste of time. It's changing; the perception is changing. But you know, again, there's this fear. Um, you know, the first one of the first grants I wrote, um, I talked about you know using gaming technology, you know, for, for training, medical training, and I was told by some senior people, don't use the word game; use the word simulation. And you know, so I did that. I got the grant, and I was happy. And now, you know, 180. It's, no, no, don't use the word simulation, use the word game. In Canada, anyways, gaming is, is very popular. The government is putting a, a huge emphasis on games, or has put a huge, huge emphasis on games. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but the primary reason is games equals money, right? It's business, and it's a thriving business in Canada. Canada is the third uh, biggest gaming um, um, in terms of market, you know, so... It means money, and it creates jobs. And so the government, that's what they want. Um, the other quote I'm going to use is from Marshall McLuhan. He's a, a Canadian, very famous Canadian um, a philosopher, educator. I mean, he's a lot of things. And, you know, this is a really good quote. Um, anyone who makes a distinction between education and entertainment doesn't know the first thing about either one. So, in other words, learning, you know, why can't learning be fun? There's no reason why it can't be. Um, we've been taught, and, and if you look at traditional courses, and I'll speak for, for Canada, which, which I know, you know, course, you know, uh, subjects such as math, you know, students dread math, and, and I mean, it starts from a very young age, because it's not, it's not really taught right. I mean, it can be fun, but it's not. It can be so much fun if you start throwing math with computer graphics, for example. Um, you know, matrices, all of a sudden you can have, you know, planets rotating around the sun and you can make it interactive and fun, yet it's not done like that. And there's this fear of, you know, math, just as an example. So, why can't it be fun and why can't you get students to, to, to be involved in the learning process and make it interactive and, and what have you. So, this is a really good quote. Keep that in mind as I'm going through the, the presentation. And, of course, as I talk, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in and ask. So, I'll start off by defining or at least covering simulation. So, who's going to tell me what simulation is? You don't have to be shy, don't you? Anyone? Who plays sports? What kind of sports? Come on, only like a few hands. Like everyone plays sports. What kind of sports? Anyone do martial arts? Boxing? Okay, Taekwondo. So in Taekwondo, you have a competition, right? There's competitions. What do you do before the competition? How do you prepare for the competition? Uh, we greet each other. 
No, before, before, to get ready for the competition. Uh, we used to jog a little, uh, train, uh, speak with our uh, trainer about how we're going to uh, proceed to the fight. Okay, you hit the, the do you have any pads? You hit the, the, the kicking pads? Uh, we do so, but uh, not before we go to... Yeah. So the point is, you prepare. Yes. <coughs> and when you're preparing, you're using simulation. Okay. So if you look at boxing, boxing is a really good example. Um, here's Mike Tyson. Ultimately, he's going to face an opponent. And to prepare for the opponent, I mean, he can sit there and get in the ring and fight every day, two months before his fight, but he's not going to do that because that's very, you know, it's going to beat up his body. So what does he do? He hits the punching bag, he hits the, the small bag, the, the focus mitts. All of this prepares him for that fight. This is all simulation. So the punching bag, it represents an opponent. So you're simulating an opponent. It's not a very high fidelity model of an opponent because the punching bag doesn't hit back, but nonetheless, it's a model that represents the opponent. Um, so this is, you know, every, anyone who plays sports has been involved in simulation. So most of you, if not all of you, have, you know, experienced simulation of some sort. Um, simulation, it's been used for thousands of years, military, uh, primarily, it started off, military started using it, they wanted to train their soldiers. Uh, ancient Greek soldiers, Roman soldiers, how did they practice? Well, they wanted to practice, you know, they had their sword, they would take a tree, you know, a tree trunk, and they would strike the tree trunk with their sword. Now the tree trunk, again, it represents an opponent. That opponent, not very high fidelity, or it's a very low you know, quality uh, representation of an opponent because the opponent doesn't hit back or the tree trunk doesn't hit back. But nonetheless, they were able to practice their, their, their sword striking techniques. Um, later on, they took the, you know, logs and they would hang them on a tree and then, they, you know, they introduced motion and, and what have you. But nonetheless, it goes back thousands of years to ancient Greece and, and, and you know, ancient uh, Rome. Medicine, they've been using um, simulation for hundreds of years. Probably one of the first known attempts at Medical simulation was midwifery in the 1500s, and today, you know, any medical doctor has practiced on a mannequin, you know, again, simulation. Who's been on a plane? Okay, most of you. So the pilot that's flying your, your plane has practiced in a, in a simulator, okay? So again, simulation to mimic the, the real world. So is it clear what simulation is now? Yes? Who's not clear? Okay, good. So I can move on. So simulation, again, you know, flight simulator is very common today. It started off in, in, during the World War. The link trainer in the 1920s, I think, was, was one of the first flight simulators, a device to implement simulation. And it moved on. Um, so, again, simulation, the whole point of it is to allow you to experience situations that are difficult or even impossible to achieve in reality. And that could be for a number of reasons. Cost, obviously, it's very expensive to replicate certain things in the real world. Um, so you use simulation. And there's also ethical concerns. What if you wanted to practice how to deal with um, a nuclear plant explosion? Are you going to do that in the real world? Yes. No? Probably not, right? Or, or at least I'm not anyways. I mean, if you guys want to, I'll be far away. Um, but you use simulation. And, you know, similarly with explosions and, and, and what have you, and, and, and the police forces, armies, they, they, they train with simulation. Now, one of the things to look at, um, you know, armed forces like the U.S., the U.S. Army, Canadian, many others as well, they're actually investing a huge amount of money, and they've done so for a long time, for, for, for many years now, in virtual technologies. In other words, um, rather than focusing on you know, war games, for example, where you're actually going in with, you know, in, in reality, um, they're focusing on, on the virtual. And to do so, they're using immersive technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, and serious gaming in particular. 
So in other words, they're using games to train it. I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go on. Um, now the virtual, again, you're allowed, you're, you're essentially, think of it as playing a game, learning by playing a game. You're in front of your screen of some sort, or perhaps a headset, and you're going through these scenarios, and you're training and practicing in, in, in the process. Now there's a lot of reasons why they're moving into virtual. Um, one, it, or a, a potential cost savings, and if you look at a lot of the, you know, video games are popular. So if you're an army now and you want to motivate and train people, kids that are 18, 19 years old, you're going to use games because it's, they're engaging, they're interactive, and everyone plays games. Um, and there's a lot of other reasons, and I'll talk about that um, a little bit. <coughs> uh, but nonetheless, this is an example, whoops. This is an example of um, a game that was developed to train first responders, Navy first responders. Um, it's called Pulse, um, and it was developed by the U.S. Navy um, in conjunction with um, one of the schools in the U.S. in, in Texas, and some other um, examples there too. This is actually from uh, a dental um, training, training app and some other ones. So playing games, I'm just going to move away from simulation. I'm going to connect all this after. You'll see it all come together. But I'm going to just jump into playing games. And what is play? Uh, have, uh, well, I mean, it's on there now, but we all play, right? I mean, is it safe to assume? Anyone here not play ever in their life? No, I, I mean, if anyone put their hand up, I'd say there's a real problem. Um, so, okay, we're, we're good. So, when we play, we're doing something for fun, for, for no other reason but for, you know, self-enjoyment, okay? Um, engage in an activity for enjoyment and recreation rather than for a serious or a practical purpose. So, you're doing something because you enjoy it, because it's fun. Um, we're not the only, humans aren't the only ones that play. Um, animals play. And if we look at play, Although we don't think about, we may not necessarily think about it, play has, is, is actually fundamental to our survival, or the survival of you know, any species. So if you look at a lion, lions in the jungle, or you know, in, in, in the African plains, they have to take down prey to survive. They have to eat to survive. So how do they actually, how does a lion take down its prey? Well, it has a technique that it follows. Um, it uh, takes it from the back, usually, not always, but generally it'll take it from the back and it'll follow this type of scenario over here. If you look at lion cubs, I mean, how does a lion actually learn how to take down its prey and sort of eat and survive? Well, if you look at the lion cubs, they mimic that same behavior. So the cubs here, they're playing amongst each other, but yet, look at the behaviors that they're mimicking. They're mimicking the behavior that the adult lion uses to take down its prey. So by doing this and by playing for you know hundreds and thousands of hours or hours on end, they're mimicking and they're practicing and they're honing their skills. And when they get older and they have to go out and survive on their own, that play, that repetition of, of, of you know these these movements is going to come in and it's going to help them take down their prey. They'll practice and, and what have you. But nonetheless, you don't have a lion, you know, mother lion, you know, dictating to the cubs what to do. I mean they it's instinctive. They, they play and they learn by playing. So play itself, it's vital for survival of you know, many spe or all, the, all species, including humans as well. Um, and if we look at, move, move a step forward now, we get into games. So games are essentially play with added rules. You can think of it as play with rules to, to some degree. Okay, so it's kind of formalized play. And games themselves, and when I asked earlier about games, you know, I wasn't referring to video games specifically. Um, we've been playing games as, you know, humans have been playing games for thousands of years. And games go back to ancient Iraq, ancient Egypt, um, 4,500 years ago. So, you know, many thousands of years ago. Um, the game of Ur, the game of uh, Senate, uh, one of them is from Egypt, one of them is from Iraq, I can't remember which one. But nonetheless, We've been playing games for a long, long time. Um, who plays chess? Does anyone know how chess came about or why it came about? Anyone? You guys are shy. 
Anyone, any guess? Any guess? India, you're close, India. Uh, I heard, I'm not sure that that's correct, but an emperor asked for a game, and then this guy bent his chest, and uh, for the emperor to repay him, he asked for the lives. I haven't heard of that one, actually. <laughs> it could be, but it was actually done for, uh, it was, it was uh, developed in India, and it was to train Indian Army strategists, so specifically done for military strategy. So chess itself was developed to train army strategists. Um, so when you're playing playing chess, think about that now. Okay, if you never knew about it. Um, so again, you know, a game developed for teaching and learning purposes it goes back, you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, can't remember the exact time, but it was, you know, many hundreds of, year, of, of years ago. Um, so again, we had a game that was developed specifically to teach and train military strategy. Okay, so in other words, in other words by playing the game, the, the, the army um, officers would play chess and they'd learn about strategy and how to, ultimately how to strategize on the field. Um, so that's games in general and we move into video games and video games are games, they're, they're no different than you know, chess or um, Senate or Ur, the, you know, these ancient games. But now, one thing that changes is we're manipulating images electronically um, on a display via a computer. Okay, so essentially the only thing that's changed is the medium. You know, instead of playing on a board, for example, like chess, we're playing via a computer display with a computer. So there's no difference. You know, video games are games. We've been playing, you know, there's this whole hype about video games, but, you know, essentially they're games. They're nothing new. We've been playing games for thousands of years. Okay? And I don't want to date myself here, but, you know, these are kind of, these are great games. You guys know what this is, right? Okay. Who doesn't know? Okay, good. I, I actually, in one of my courses, I teach a course on game sound. And I played a, a clip, an audio clip from Pac-Man, and I was shocked when like two students didn't know what it was. Now, I don't know if they were just joking with me or, I don't know, but I was, it was kind of, I thought, oh, geez, I'm old. Um, and then this one here. Anyone? Donkey Kong. And this one, Galaga. So yeah, okay, those are my three favorite games. Uh, so if we look at gaming, gaming itself, you know, there's this, you know, cr I'll say craze, but it's not a new, it's really not a new phenomenon. I, I mean, if you look at gaming and video games, they've been popular from the time they came out back in the late 70s. Um, arcades, you know, perhaps most of you are, are too young to remember this, but when I grew up, there used to be arcades. I never had a, a console at home. Well, I, I did, but, you know, not early on. Um, and we used to go to the arcade and play arcade games and go to this place and, and play games, you know, put our quarters in and, and, and play these video games, Pac-Man and, and what have you. Um, so, game, you know, video games are not a new phenomenon, but it seems like it is. I mean, you know, right now everything is gaming, gaming, gaming. And if you look at it from a market perspective, games are big business. And, you know, games like Grand Theft Auto, for example, Grand Theft Auto V, um, it broke all kinds of records. Um, 815.7 million in sales the first day. Okay, that's uh, roughly 11 million units sold in you know one one day. Um, one billion in sales in three days. That's a, that's a huge amount of money. Um, and it, I mean you know games sales of games have uh, you know are, are they top? Um, they're the top in entertainment. They beat the, the the music music industry. They've bet you know Hollywood. So games are games are big. And, you know, games, the, the other interesting, some other interesting facts, when we look at video games, they're not specific to, at one point, back in the 80s and maybe in the 90s to some degree, um, it was basically adolescent males, you know, teenage boys playing in their basement, you know, first-person shooters, right? And it was all blood, guts, and, and all the cool stuff. Um, but that's not... Uh, not now. That that has changed, and it's not the case anymore. So females, children, and older and older adults are all of all ages are playing games. Anyone know when that really started to happen? When it really took off? When video games really took off? 
aside from first-person shooters, or moved away from first-person shooters? Anyone? Remember the Nintendo Wii? Yeah. So that really, what, what was so interesting about the Wii? The games, I mean, the, the graphics were nothing great, but... It was for casual gamers, probably. For casual people that want to have a game with the family. Absolutely, and what made it, what made it so? Um, the games the themselves, yes. The, the controls. The, the controllers, controllers exactly. Wii. So all of a sudden, we moved away from that first person, you know, WN, you know, the, the keys and the, the, the keyboard and, and mouse. And we took the, we made the player part of the whole experience. All of a sudden, they were, you know, using it to, to box or whatever they were doing. They were part of the experience. So all of a sudden, interaction became important. And that in itself, in, in my opinion, changed, you know, the, the whole gaming scene. Okay, it really brought... It brought focus on, on interaction and, and on the whole experience. And that made it you know, a lot more engaging and a lot more fun for others to join in. Others, you know, aside from the adolescent males that were playing first-person shooters. In Canada, there's, there's been you know, many examples and in, in, in across the world, I, I, I'm, I'm, I would imagine. Um, you know, they brought the, the Nintendo Wii, and when it first came out, they brought it into old age homes and they had people that would generally be very solitary. They brought them together and they were having fun and playing together and had them, you know, interact and communicate. So there's a lot of really good things that came out of it, okay? And again, it was the interaction. So we moved away from, you know, graphics, highly realistic graphics, and we moved into interaction. Um, in Canada, 48% of, of game players are female, so it's not, again, specific to, to males. <clears throat> and by age 21, the average American in the U.S., Canada is the same, um, will have spent more than 10,000 hours playing video games. So 10,000 hours, you guys know what that is? It's a lot. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, they say that 10,000 hours and you're an expert. Right? After, you know, if you practice something for 10,000 hours, you become an expert. So, okay. you, you, you do the rest. Become an expert at playing video games. Now, that being said, there's actually, <clears throat> there's a lot of good that actually comes out of playing video games. Just video games, entertainment-based video games. Um, there was a study that was done in, New, I think it was New York, and they took um, laparoscopic surgeons. Now, laparoscopic surgeons, they need, you know, very good hand-eye, you know, coordination, dexterity. And they look at a monitor and they operate on, you you know, within the, they look at a 2D display and that 2D display is basically, you know, inside your body, a 3D object. Um, what they did was they had laparoscopic surgeons and they had uh, teenage, uh, teenagers video game players that played a lot of video games, and they had them do some hand-eye coordination tasks, tasks that required good hand-eye coordination. And what they found was that they, they, they actually were equal, they, they uh, performed equally well. So the, the kids that played video games and the laparoscopic surgeons performed equally well on these hand-eye, specific hand-eye coordination tasks. Now, it's not to say that the kids could be laparoscopic surgeons, but I know, you know of course not. But it just shows that by playing video games, you hone those skills, those hand-eye coordination skills. And there's many, many examples of, of, of doing so. So any questions so far? So for those that don't play video games, is that convincing enough to start playing video games? No, maybe not. Okay. Um, so now we move into serious games. And it's basic, I mean, there's a lot of definitions here, and I don't want to, I'm not going to get into the definitions, but just think of them as video games whose primary purpose is educational instead of entertainment. And I know there's debate about this term and, and, and what have you, okay? But um, it's basically using games and video game based technology to, you know, for education and, and learning purposes and training purposes. And the first likely serious game was Battlezone, it was a, a game released by Atari in 1980. And it was actually modified, a modified version of it was used by the U.S. Army to train tank gunners. They were actually using it to train tank gunners. I don't think it went too well, but nonetheless, the U.S. Army from 1980 has been using video games to train. They've realized that there's value to it. Um, 
unlike many others in, in the educational field, uh, areas and, and what have you, um, the U.S. Army realized that there's a lot of value in using games to train. It engages people and, and they're interactive and, and what have you. <clears throat> so right now, what I'll do is wrap up. I talked about simulation, talked about playing games, and talked about serious games. So if we look at, and again, I won't go into the theory here, but every serious game is itself a game. Every game is a simulation. So we've been using simulation for thousands of years. We've been playing games for thousands of years. Why not use games to train? And that's really the whole kind of, you know, I hope that comes across here. Um, it's nothing new. Games for training is really nothing new. When you consider that games, we've been playing games thousands of years. Simulation, we've been using it for, like, you know, why not use games to train? Okay? And that's really the kind of, the, the, where I'm going to focus on now, okay? the, well, the, the use of games and immersive tech, adding immersive tech to, to, to the mix. Um, and I'm going to focus on, on medical education. Um, but just again, because most of you are students here, think of opportunities. Um, serious gaming is actually a growing area. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of estimates. Uh, it's been estimated to be a two to ten billion dollar uh, global market. But the, the key is that it's growing. And by growing, it means that people with your skills that are graduating from you know, computer science and engineering and electrical engineering and, and that type of thing, you guys have good opportunities. And you know, it's a growing area, so there's going to be a lot of jobs. Um, in 2014, the US, the United States institutional market for pre-K-12 um, education, software and content in, gen, uh, in total, was 8.38 billion. That's not only serious games, of course, it's just in general using interactive software for, for education and training. Um, so it's a, it's a big market and it's growing. <clears throat> in Canada, uh, you know, the serious gaming companies are very small, but there's some key, there's some really big players in the US, and the US really dominates the market in terms of serious gaming. Um, I, I, for the most part. Um, Breakaway Games, for example, they've done a lot of work for the US military and they continue to do a lot of serious gaming work for the military. And they get, you know, they're, they're funded with millions of dollars. Um, in to March of 2015, Ubisoft, you guys know who Ubisoft is? Big French gaming company. They have a big presence in Canada. Um, and what was really so they, they announced in 2015 Dig Rush, and that was basically, it was a serious game. So it was the first serious game by one of the big players, or at least Canadian companies in Canada, to, to, uh, they're, they're a French company. Um, and it was to treat amblyopia. Okay, so you're getting these big players now that are realizing, hey, you know, it's not just about entertainment. There's a, you know, another big market that, that has a lot of uh, potential and opportunity. Um, so the other thing too, again, for people with your skills, CAE, big simulator company, they're, they're a Canadian company, and they make all the flight simulators for Boeing, for Airbus, and they do a lot of simulation work. Um, they've had openings, I haven't checked recently, but you know, a few, few months ago, a couple years ago, um, they had openings for game designers, for multimedia developers, again, people with <clears throat> skills such as what you have. Um, there's real good opportunities. These guys are a big company, and you would never think, I mean, big, you know, been around for, for decades, they make simulators, you know, real serious stuff, and they're looking for game designers. And why are they looking for game designers? Because game designers and game developers currently, they have the skills to create these virtual simulations. They use, they're, they're, they have good math skills, um, they use all the appropriate tools, they have good computer graphics background. Um, they use Unity, Unreal, for example. They have the skills that are needed to create these virtual sims. And that's what's really driving a lot of the simulation um, area, virtual. So yeah, I, you know, a, a lot of good reasons. I talked about the, um, you know, if, why use simulation, virtual simulations and, and serious gaming. You know, in, in medicine, sim labs where you have these mannequins, these real, you know, life-size mannequins and very realistic mannequins, they're extremely expensive. Those mannequins can cost over $100,000. Um, and you know, creating a lab to, ha to house these, you know, you're talking about millions of dollars. You need space, you need um, the resort, the, the, the equipment, you need people to 
take care of the labs, monitor the labs. These are very expensive and they're limited. Um, and, you know, so what, we're not saying get rid of these labs, by no means, you still need those labs. What we're saying is, perhaps we can get better prepare the students to go into the lab so that when they're in the lab, which is limited resources and limited time, they make the, you know, the best use of it. So how do you prepare them to go into the lab? You use virtual tools and, and, and serious gaming. Okay? And, and that's really, um, in Canada, that's where a lot of the, the, the focus is, uh, is placed on, using these virtual tools. So you kind of have this scaffolded learning approach, Oops. Uh, where you have, um, you know, novice residents, they'll train on these virtual sims and, and you know, with serious games. They're better prepared to go into the lab. When they go into the lab, they make better, they make better use of the lab in the limited time they have in there. Now, one of the things that, if we look at serious gaming, for the most part, a lot of the emphasis is currently placed on, and virtual sims in general, on cognitive skills training. So by cognitive, I mean, you know, the, 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 the procedures, you know, steps and, and, and tools required for, uh, to complete a procedure. Um, technical is still very limited because to, to, to mimic or to simulate the technical aspects of you know, medical procedures, for example, you need expensive equipment, haptic devices, and those haptic devices, or at least to get high fidelity that's needed for medicine, they're very expensive. So we're, we're still fairly limited. But cost is coming down with the emerging, you know, like VR and, and all this good stuff that's coming out, a lot of that stuff is coming down. So again, the price is coming down. So again, more opportunities for students like you, okay, to do some really cool stuff with you know, Arduinos and, 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 and all kinds of things like that. And I'll show some examples later. Now this brings me to, so any questions so far? No? Yeah? Uh, so what do you mean by this? So, so there's definitely some things that we can't do still. So there's definitely a gap in that sense. Um, we can't recreate reality perfectly. Um, and if you look at um, a lot of the sims, uh, the medical sims, um, you know, you run into the, you, there, if you try to replicate reality very faithfully, depending on what you're doing, I mean, you can create an environment and make it very realistic. But when you start getting into the, you know, the nitty gritty, like you know, cutting with a scalpel, having the blood flow, that becomes very difficult to simulate. And what you can get into is you can kind of get into an effect that can actually be very bad because all of a sudden you have this very realistic, you know, operating theater and, and environment and you know, cool machinery, and, and you can do that. And then you start cutting, and you realize it doesn't quite flow right, or something's not right. Um, and then that can just break your whole suspension of disbelief, and then you know that you're not, you know, you're, you know that it's fake, for example. Um, so, so there's a lot of interesting questions there, and there's still a lot of technical things that we can't do, um, that we're limited with. Um, but again, things are changing so fast that it's becoming better and better. Um, and then the other question about reality is, how much reality do we actually need? And that's kind of an open question, too. Do you really need all these, you know, faithful graphics and, 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 and what have you? And the answer to that seems to be not always. It depends on the learner and on the task at hand. So what level of the learner is. So, so there's definitely gaps. There's technological gaps. And there's also gaps even with respect to, um, you know, uh, teaching methods. Like how do you actually, depending on, you know, what level you are and what the task is and, you know, find the, 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 the right level of fidelity. So definitely gaps. But gaps are good because that means jobs for you guys, right? Mm -hmm. Problems for you guys to work on. And in Canada, I know that this is a, a really big area. Yep. Is there any serious games uh, using augmented reality? Yep. Um, a lot of it. And, and in medicine, too. There's actually a group in uh, Florida, and I, I can't remember their names, uh, but they're doing a lot of medical based training with augmented reality. And the nice thing about that is that you could, with augmented reality, you're looking at, you get the real and the virtual combined. And so now imagine you're looking at, a cadaver, for example. Imagine an anatomy class where you're looking at a cadaver and you you're looking at it through, you know, your augmented reality headset. If you're a novice trainee, all of a sudden, you know, very simply, you can you can you know put labels on body parts. You can label them and, and provide. So absolutely, they're doing that, and you can get into far more difficult um, 
So if you have to cut, you know, if, if you're going to do some form of cutting, for example, you can, if you're, if you're new or, or more of a novice or intermediate learner, you can perhaps guide the user as they're cutting through the virtual body part or, or the real body part, things like that. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. And augmented reality, in my opinion, I think augmented reality is where things are going to really uh, become, it's more augmented reality than, or, or be bigger than virtual reality. A large class of those applications of uh, serial games util utilizes essentially the actual world. The basic games is a very large class that has a lot of applications. Mm -hmm. For example, fighting fights or fighting floods or whatever you want. And this, it may reduce the need for big virtual reality, but you need the augmented reality part. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think augmented is where, where things are, are definitely going to. And there's some, some interesting articles on that on that effect too. Um, you know, and, and, and then even if you're looking at large classes, I mean, it's not to say that this is you know perfect because even with large classes, you know, then equipment becomes an issue, and, and you know, so it's not it's not there's issues even with this stuff too, uh, of course. Um, you know, equipment is still, you know, you can buy a, a an HTC Vive for about twelve hundred dollars, but you, know, you can buy one for twelve hundred. I mean, it becomes expensive, or, or a Microsoft HoloLens is, you know, several thousand dollars still. So, you know, there's, there's still issues. It's not, by no means, there's problems. But, you know, as time goes by and as the technology improves, it, the costs become less and that becomes less of a problem. And then, you know, how do you actually, if you have a class with 200 students, how do you immerse them all, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, logistical issues too. So, this moves into any other questions? So immersive tech, so when we're talking about immersive technology, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I don't know how much time I have. Um, I don't know. You may be 20 minutes. Oh, okay, okay. So I'll move through the immersive tech fairly quickly. But when we're talking about uh, immersive technology, I think it's, it's fairly clear. We're talking about um, technology that blurs the line between the physical world and the digital or simulated world. And it creates this sense of immersion. And I usually don't like Wikipedia, but I, I like this definition, so I, I wrote it down. Um, and the key really is immersion. Um, the sensation of being in an environment. So you kind of, you're, you're creating this sense of being somewhere else. Now it could be purely in your, in your head, but nonetheless, you're creating this sense of being somewhere else. Um, now, the, 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 the best example of immersion, of being, you know, caught up in this suspension of disbelief where you, you, you kind of ignore everything else around you, it's not even virtual reality. It's a book. Who reads a book? Not an e-book, a real book. Maybe even an e-book. Well, what happens when you, you, you read a good novel and you just can't put it down? Has that happened to anyone? Good. Okay, a lot of you. That's, that's a perfect example of being immersed. You kind of forget about everything else and you kind of put yourself into that story, so to speak. And, you know, I think that's a, a great, uh, great example. Um, you know, movies, the same thing. You can be immersed in movies and, and comic books and, and what have you. I actually, I, I use this, the Da Vinci Code, because that was the last book, I think, the last novel I wrote, read, many, many years ago. And it was, I couldn't put it down. I mean, I read it, I just couldn't put it down. And that's an, a, a great example of immersion. Um, now, the key with immersive tech, we're hearing a lot about it, and this whole craze right now with virtual reality and augmented reality, but again, it's nothing new. Um, back in 1956, the Sensorama was released, um, and it was basically a single person, you're, you know, kind of in this contraption over here, you're looking at this monitor, and you're holding on to these, you know, grips. Um, and you perceive a pre-recorded experience of, I think it was a motorcycle ride, if I'm not mistaken, and you have fans blowing air on you, so you kind of, no, the graphics, it was a video, I mean, it was, you know, it was a great fidelity or, or very, I mean, it was realistic because it was video, but nonetheless, nothing new, so, you know, over 50, 60 years. But what has happened as technology has improved, I mean, this is this whole, you know, big contraption over here. As technology has improved, things become faster and they become smaller. Ultimately, computing is computing, but it's become faster and smaller. Um, and over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been huge advancement in the areas of computing and computing devices. You know, cell phones are, are a perfect example. Um, and then you had, we talked about the, the Wiimote and the Wii, the, the Nintendo Wii. 
um, the Kinect, the Microsoft Kinect, you have the Leap Motion and, and, and things like that. So this is really creating a lot of opportunities for you guys again, because you can do some really cool stuff. There's been some really you know, bright things that have come out of, you know, people have come up with some really good uses for this. Like the Microsoft Connect, which is able to, to detect uh, motions in 3D space. Um, in Toronto, at the, one of the hospitals in Toronto, there was a, you know, a very simple project, a good project, I don't, I don't mean to say that it's you know, simple but good, um, where they, had sur they, they hooked up a Connect in the operating room, and they had surgeons that wanted to go through x-rays, Rather than pressing buttons on a keyboard, they were or, or some button of some sort, they would just you know move their hand, make this you know particular motion, and they'd slide through all the, the X-rays. So that's an example of gaming technology, pure gaming technology, applied to a real world for a very good cause, and 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 you know created and made life easier for the surgeon in the operating room. Uh, current buzz. Virtual reality, augmented reality, and it really started with um, stereoscopic 3D TVs and Avatar, the film, a number of years ago. Continued with the Oculus, and there was a great buzz when Facebook purchased Oculus for $2 billion. Um, and now you have HTC Vive. Anyone here use the HTC Vive? What do you guys, yeah, what do you, what do you, what do you guys think of the HTC Vive? It's a... Um... It seems like uh, the Oculus Rift, the new one, the same thing, but you have uh, more controls, you, uh, you, yeah. uh, you, you feel that you're really inside the VR. Yeah, that's the impression I got. I felt like I was really, I, I get motion sickness, so I couldn't use the Oculus. And then I put on the Vive, and I thought, wow, this is really good. Like, it, it's, it's really good. I was really impressed with it. And again, with the vibe, you're able to stand and move around. So you're interacting, the interaction, you know, it's, it's far better than the older version of, of Oculus, right? So that's, you know, but we're able to do some really cool stuff. Um, Microsoft HoloLens, um, and I have the main driver here is games, or at least it was games, but that's really changing. Games, I don't know if games are gonna be the, the main driver of VR, and there's some, some debate on that. But a big area of VR and immersive tech is going to be medicine and or medical education and health and well-being. And you know, if you look at games, the problem with putting on these headsets, you become very solitary. Okay, and until we come up with a way where we can interact, I don't know how big of a gaming market there's going to be. Okay, so unless there's some way to really interact with people. Um, it's very solitary. But with training, these, these tools are actually creating some good opportunities for training. And in medicine, they're talking, there's a number of, um, of areas where this is you know, very important. T teaching medical professionals, but also educating patients as well. Um, and there's a big, big area in that. Here's the Oculus. I'll go through that. HTC Vive. <clears throat> the HoloLens. And, you know, now everything, you know, it looks like the emphasis is on viewing and, and you know, everything, you have these displays and obviously that's a big component, be, being able to project in stereoscopic 3D, but it's not the only thing. Um, there's haptics and simulating the sense of touch. That's an area, a growing area as well, where there's a lot of opportunities for you guys with your skills. Um, right now, haptic rendering is very limited or at least if you want good haptic rendering, it's very expensive. And um, there's a limited number of efficient and affordable haptic devices uh, to the general well, There hardly isn't. There isn't any. Um, there's a few gaming, gaming um, devices that are, that are cool. You can do some cool things with them, but they're fairly low fidelity. Um, Novit Falcon is one. This one here is actually pretty good. Uh, the Geomagic Sculpt, it's about $1,000, and you can get some Pretty cool. You can do some good things with it. Um, so yeah, again, as I talked about uh, gaming, but it's you know that with immersive tech, that divide between you know and VR, like the, the really that line between games and, and virtual reality is really it has eroded. Games, VR, it's all pretty well the same. Because if you look at VR. What are they using to develop VR applications? They're using gaming engines and gaming tools. So it's pretty well, it's one, okay? And again, when you're dealing with virtual, um, virtual reality and virtual simulations for training and, and for military training or medical training, it's really 
gaming. You're using game design and game, game, game development tools and techniques. So, okay, I'll just talk, I'll briefly um, show some of the stuff that, just give you an example of, uh, this was done with the HTC Vive, and this was um, uh, a virtual sim developed uh, to train um, anesthesiologist residents on the epidural procedure, so what they have to do to prepare for giving the epidural procedure. They weren't actually giving the epidural procedure, but they were going through the steps required, um, you know, washing hands, that type of thing. So I'll just show you that. This was done with the Vive, and this we did with a um, number of doctors, or with two anesthesiologists at the uh, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Canada. So we actually run a study with this, with uh, anesthesiologists, uh, anesthesiology residents, um, and we've in the process of writing that. So that, that operating room, it was done, it's a fairly good representation of an actual operating room at Sunnybrook. Um, it's modeled fairly faithfully, I mean, in terms of dimensions and, and the equipment and what have you. Um, so yeah, I'm just getting that, give you a feel of what that looks like. So yeah, you go through the whole procedure. I'm not going to show the whole thing. Uh, but nonetheless, um, one of the other things, uh, patient education, this is with a cardiologist, again, at, or at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And what he's, he's really interested in, um, he's, you know, the, the nice thing about, you get a lot of medical people in, in Canada anyways, and they're really excited about technology. And they actually approached me, and you know, I, I was talking to Katarina earlier about um, you know, one of the, the anesthesiologists that I, I showed, that I worked with on the previous project, he actually came to me when I gave a talk, and he, he said, Bill, I want to talk to you, I bought this Oculus Rift, and I want to do something with it. So, I mean, the guy's not a tech person, but he bought the Oculus Rift, and he came to talk to me about using it. Um, so, you know, they're very uh, passionate and very um, excited about tech, which is really cool to see. Um, this is with um, a cardiologist at St. Michael's Hospital, um, and he was really interested in patient education. So he was, in, uh, he was interested in educating patients going into a catheterization lab to do an angiogram procedure. And the whole theory behind this is if you educate the patient on what they're going to go through, what to expect, and on aftercare, um, patient care is better. And it makes the task of the doctors better too, obviously. So, just so again, they're going through. Basically, they're they're in the. Um, this is the view that they're going to see from the headset, left eye, right eye, um, and they're going through the <coughs> procedure of what's going to you know what the patient will expect as they're going through the angiogram procedure. Um, and now this. This is actually, this was a fourth year project uh, that was done by, by a group of students. And the one student is continuing on and he's gonna do this as his master's work. So he's gonna create this framework that's gonna allow customization of the environment and the procedures and, and, and what have you. Now the nice thing about it is that this is driven by you know, a medical professional. And there's a want, you know, the, the medical folks and the medical professionals want this stuff. So the kids now that are the students that are actually you know, doing their masters, and it really, it's very rewarding for them to, to actually work on this stuff and do things that will potentially, you know, do a lot of good to the general public. So it's actually really cool, and, and the students are very motivated to work on these projects. Um, some other work, um, looking at using um, the Vive to look at the eye fundus exam, or examination of the eye. Um, I don't have a video for this, but nonetheless, uh, we're just mimicking an ophthalmoscope and looking at the eye, looking at the structure of the eye. And human anatomy, educa uh, human anatomy education, this is where augmented reality can play a really big role. And we've done some work in this domain using um, uh, tablets, uh, a big display, or ideally a tabletop display where you display, for example, the body. In this case, it's the eye. Um, and then you can have you know, individual trainees with their own smartphones or tablets 
and they can go in and look at a customized view of the body that's displayed on the main table. And you can have, again, for novice trainees, you can present them with, uh, you know, label the parts, just in a, in a, in a very simple manner. Um, and for more complex, or, or for more uh, advanced trainees, you can move that information and, and create these different scenarios. Um, yeah, this was actually work, we hacked up that table, you can see the 3D markers, and we did that very quickly. That was a, a project in, in Japan that we worked with some colleagues in Japan. Um, and I was able to bring a couple of students to Japan, and we did this all in one week. We rigged this up in one week, and that was kind of the, come to Japan, but you got to do this for one week. And it was, it was kind of cool. Um, this was work um, done with, this was a few years ago, but I like to, um, this was done with some orthopedic surgeons at Mount Sinai. And one of the problems they had, um, they would, um, their trainees, the orthopedic, the, the residents, the, the very begin, beginner residents, they would come into the operating room to look at um, a, a knee replacement. We're looking at knee replacement here. And they were given you know, textbooks to read about the procedure. And what the surgeons were finding, or you know, the, the trainers were finding, was that the residents were ill-prepared. They weren't just reading the material. They were coming into the operating room, and they weren't prepared. And they were, that wastes time. And time accounts for money, obviously, but it's also you know patient care. That whole there's a lot of reasons why you don't you want to you don't want to waste time in the operating room. Um, so what they again they approached um, myself, and we wanted to go through the steps and the tools required for each step. There's about a hundred something uh, steps in replace uh, knee replacement surgery, full knee replacement. Um, so we went through and we created this sim of that. And again, it's just to go through the steps and the, um, the tools required in each step. And so we actually ran some studies with it, and we did find that for novice trainees, it actually is, it's effective. Whoops. So again, this is going back a number of years ago. And it was, you know, it was really, um, it was really interesting where, you know, working with, with the, you know, obviously when you're working as, as, a, as an engineer, working with you know, the, the, the content experts, the game itself or the sim is driven by the content, right? I mean, you have to abide by the content. Um, so you have, you know, when you're working in, in these interdisciplinary teams, it's very important to understand the language of each other, right? And, and to know that, um, you know, you have to, let them know that there's limitations, there's things we can't do. Like when we were going through this game, we had a list of we want this, 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 and we want it done, you know, next week. And, you know, my thing was, well, you might get this and you might get that, and it'll be done in a year. Um, so, you know, just expectations, um, and even, even language, you know, one of the, uh, I'm gonna go through that again. One of my, my, the student that actually worked on this, he had a little video, and I might show it later. Um, and, you know, he was like, uh, he talked about what it's like to work with the doctors, and he said they went in and, and they made it clear. He's not going to talk tech to them if they don't speak Greek to him. So that was kind of funny, the doctors speaking Greek to him. Um, so again, with this game, with the, 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 the knee game, currently what we're doing is we're adding the drilling process to it. So we're at, adding um, actual technical skills, and we're focusing on drilling. There's a lot of drilling that happens when you're going and, and replacing a knee. Um, and what we're doing is... Rather than use a high-end haptic device, we're using a low-end haptic device, which is limited fidelity, but we're trying to compensate for that low fidelity with sound. So can we use, or we're investigating whether we can use sound to increase the, the, the haptic fidelity uh, perception that the user has. So that would allow us to use a, um, a low-end haptic device um, in place of a high-end one, potentially. And that goes into um, this whole area of, um, uh, I forgot the name, oh. uh, perceptual-based rendering. Okay, so, you know, kind of using, exploiting, you know, perceptual uh, effects. Um, yeah, and there's a whole bunch of things we're doing here. I'm not going to go into that. Um, and we've done a, a, a little study that looked at that. We did a drilling task. Um, and we use sound, and we did find that sound can, in fact, um, influence our perception of haptic fidelity. 
Uh, keep in mind, though, that with sound, and, and I've done a lot of work on that with respect to graphics, but it's also very subjective. So my notion of, of you know, good music, for example, may be different from yours, right? So sound is, is very subjective. Um, yeah, some other things here too, uh, oscillation training. Um, and this one here, I, I like this project. Um, this was done a few years ago, and it was using the Kinect. And this was a, a fourth year, whoops, it was a fourth year project. And it's basically using the Kinect to, this was done with a, a rehab doctor um, who, he actually invented a device, a physical devi device to, um, for uh, rehabil shoulder rehabilitation and it mimicked rowing. So what we did was we took the device and we basically used that as our main game mechanic. The movements of the, the device were mapped to So basically those swinging motions move into, or are a map to gig length and short length. So you get the idea. So yeah, and then there's, there's more, I mean, but you know, basically because we're running out, I think, um, just from, from the start, you know, there was this quest for high graphical realism. And if you go back to the games in the 90s, 80s, it was all about graphics, graphics, graphics. Now, that's actually very good because what did it do? Well, it created all the computing power that we have are directly a result of gaming. And this high quest, you know, this ever, you know, more and more greater and, and higher fidelity graphics. But then as I pointed out, the Nintendo Wii came along and it really blew that out. You know, all of a sudden graphics wasn't the focus, it was more interaction and the user, the, the user. So, you know, in terms of how much realism or fidelity is needed, it's, it's, a, it's an open question, as I pointed out earlier to one of the questions. Um, it depends on the, 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 the level of the learner and on the task at hand. You don't necessarily need expensive graphics. And I was, um, not to, a few months ago, I was in Colombia and I looked at their simulation center and what they do to train their laparoscopic surgeons is they have this little box to mimic the body. And they have their, you know, the, the, the tools that the laparoscopic surgeons use. And what they had them do was go in and peel a grape with their, you know, forceps and, and their devices. And they were peeling a grape. Low fidelity, but it does the job, right? So you don't need necessarily these high fidelity graphics. It depends on the task at hand. Um, you know, and then of course, the other thing too to keep in mind is that, you know, as a computer scientist or as engineers yourselves, it's very easy to say, I'm going to develop a game for, you know, training or to teach math, just as an example. But there's more, far more to it than that. You have to really consider the design, um, and you have to also consider that you're not an expert necessarily in math or the content, and you have to rely on the content experts. Okay, so you have to work in a team. Um, and it's very important to do the background. And by background, I mean the design. You have to really do um, your needs and task analysis. You have to look at your audience. You have to look at you know, what the use is. There's a lot of design that goes into these things. Um, and if you don't do that design, and you don't consider who your audience is, you know, whatever, the, the, whole, the whole thing, you're going to come up with a product that's not going to be effective. And you don't want that. Um, so instructional design, most important step, your needs and task analysis, um, you know, it really is, you have to, what is the objectives, what is the purpose of this game that you're doing? And of course, interdisciplinary development team, um, with medicine, you're dealing with medical professionals, educational experts, artists, the techies, you know, the engineers, the computer scientists, and that in itself can lead to problems, because oftentimes different disciplines have different language. Even though when you you may refer refer to the same thing, but you know a game developer may view simulation as one thing, whereas a medical person may view it as something else. Okay? So it's important to really hammer that stuff out. So yeah, um, yeah, we go through that, and of course, you know, typically with serious game design. Um, actually, I will just very quickly. Um, this was. Um, Breakaway Games in the U.S. They created this um, game, a serious game, to teach um, 
the flight crews on an aircraft carrier. And what they did was they had the development team actually go on an aircraft carrier for I think a number of days, I think two weeks, um, and they actually, hands on, they were like right on the deck, they were, you know, and what they did was they, they, they interviewed, they talked to the, the, the deck crew, they learned all they could about what it's like to work on the deck and, and what the job involves. But even more so, they actually went in and they started talking to the, cook, the, the kitchen staff and to the cooks. And why they did that was because the flight crew or the deck crew, they go into the kitchen. And when they go into the kitchen, they talk to the kitchen staff about events that took place on the deck. So this is all important information when you're designing and developing these games. So finally, I'll come to an end because I can just keep talking. Um, you know, it's not only about the technology. We have to think about how we use the technology. And it's not just a matter of creating a game for the sake of creating a game. And there may be cases where a game or, or a virtual sim of some sort is not necessary or not needed. So we have to really think about that and we have to really think of the design of it as well. Uh, we need to carefully consider the team and the resources um, to create an effective and useful product that makes good use of the technology. Um, and there's many unanswered questions. Um, there's a lot of technical limitations. We still can't do everything with technology. And even if we can, you have to consider that if I'm developing a game for, if I'm developing a game for, for you know, medical students, for example, I have to consider what computing platform does the average medical student have? Um, will my game be able to run, or my sim be able to run on, you know, the average person's computer? Yes, we have fast computers, but the average person's computer it's not all, you know, can't necessarily run uh, an HTC Vive application. Let alone, not everyone is going to have an HTC Vive. So you have, to, you have to really consider this. So many unanswered questions. I talked about, you know, uh, perceptual-based rendering, for example. Can we use, uh, you know, exploit certain perceptual effects to compensate for fidelity and that type of thing? So the, there's open questions, which means there's ongoing research and research to be done. But that's great opportunities for you guys. And keep in mind that the current generation of learners, uh, they're challenging the current and very outdated, for the most part, um, teaching methods. Um, and you know, really, education is moving into this learning by doing, so getting people involved. Um, you know, there's no need for me to sit in here in front of the blackboard and, and you know, write equations down. You know, how about getting involved? So teach. You know, by doing. Um, and video games, they're here to stay, they're not a fad, they're not going away. Um, you know, there's ubiquity of video gameplay today has uh, seen a recent push in the use of gamification in serious gaming. But again, proper design is required. You can't just create something for the sake of creating it. You really have to, you know, do your homework, so to speak. Um, and, you know, there's very few courses on serious gaming or, or, you know, immersive tech for educational purposes. There's, there's courses on immersive tech, but there's very few on how to create good learning tools. And, you know, technology will continue to improve. Um, and this is just, this is like about a year old now, I think, if not more. Uh, there's no audio here, so. So again, just looking at where, where electronics are going and some of the things that you can do. This is a sensor that I think was Intel, or not Intel. Um, so you can do some really cool stuff. You can detect some really fine, there. No, no, that's fine. You get the idea, I'm not gonna go through that because we're running out of time. Um, so, you know, I think, I'm not gonna say the end. Uh, you know, I think, it's not the end. I think there's a lot, of, a lot more work that needs to be done. So, you know, it's definitely not the end. And, you know, onwards we march, so to speak. So, on that note, thank you. And I know I've gone over time, so... Questions? Anyone? I don't... You talked a lot about gamification. Mm -hmm. Does Canada support that? Yeah, so, you know, good, very good question. So, in Canada, there is this real big push on the use of gaming and gamification in general um, and, and games in the classroom and even in medical education. 
Um, a lot of the grants that I have, they've been, you know, very, let's just say they've been very generous on, you know, exploring and, and investigating game-based learning technology, game-based learning technologies, I um, mean, the use of gamification in the classroom. Um, at my university, um, anything, they're, they're, they're very, very keen on it. They have a, a, an education faculty, um, and the education faculty is focused on technology and the use of gaming and, and, and tech in general um, in the classroom. So it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, and, and the graduates from that program get jobs like immediately. So it is a big buzz right now. There is a big, um, maybe buzz isn't, isn't the right word, but there's a big emphasis on, on the use of gaming and, and gamification in, in teaching and learning. And a lot of the, the other nice thing is that there's a lot of the, um, the primary schools, you know, aside from the university, so you're looking at primary schools and secondary schools, um, and they're moving into that space as well. Um, and there's, you know, I, I, I don't work with them myself, but I know colleagues that have done all kinds of studies and, and you know, incorporating games in the classroom and, and what have you. Um, I think, you know, th there's, there's a lot of opportunity, but I think it has to be done, and, and I don't like, I, I see a lot of work, that, you know, it has to be done with some thought and some care. Um, it can't just be doing it for the sake of doing it. There has to be some thought and some design uh, that goes into it. And, and it's not just a matter of getting kids to play a game. And I think a lot of it, and I've seen that a lot, where, oh, let's get this game, let's get kids to play a game. And I think that's the wrong way to go about it. And that can cause more harm than good. Um, and that happened in the 80s with that whole edutainment era, where you know computer scientists came on and said, I'm going to create games to teach anything. And you know it really flopped, and, and it just... I think that's what really caused this whole, you know, negative view on gaming and, and learning and what have you. So we have to put a lot, we have to be very careful. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah. Uh, now since we have a uh, high definition camera, for example, uh, we have 4K, so you, you can display anything you want in really good quality, right? Yeah. Why not have everything pre-recorded and let the the student, the medical student, for example, make the choices and just see the result of their choices. Yeah, so, so that's actually interesting. And, and we are, um, I'm actually looking at some work with that too. So guiding the, looking at the patient and guiding the patient through the, the, the procedure where you can actually record. Um, so that is definitely something to, that, that, that is being done and that can be done. Um, but the thing, it's not always going to be effective because you can't possibly, well, it's very difficult to create every possible scenario. Sometimes you can, and I agree, um, but sometimes you can't. And it's nice to have that ability to unforeseen events to happen and, and that type of thing. So, there, there's a, so, so yes, there are cases where that's definitely doable and, and feasible because then it's reality. Um, but there's cases where it's, it's very difficult to actually do that um, in real time to, or not in real time, time to store every possible scenario that could possibly happen. And also do it in, intera in an interactive, in an interactive manner, yeah. Right now, with, with current computing. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you have a, if you had a doctor a while, you know, uh, for an entire year, uh, you'd, uh, you'd probably have like 90% uh, of the case yeah, yeah, yeah. he was going to meet. And for the other 10%, uh, I, I know for a fact that because I have a, a friend who's a doctor, they train with, uh, with bodies, real bodies, mm -hmm. so you could simulate that other 10% in, uh, for the worst case scenarios that a doctor never wants to yep. see. So, so there's, even with that, you're still looking at a ton of data. You're going to have a, you know, a whole lot of data, and then you have to render or, or at least display, and, and the interaction becomes an issue as well. Um, as computing becomes more and more cheaper and, and better and faster, you know, perhaps that's where we are moving into. And there's a lot of work in, in that domain. I mean, I'm, I'm doing some on, on my own. I think there's a place for both. Um, and I still think there are cases where you do want to be able to have, um, you know, with the virtual, you can have um, you can have things happen, you know, as you're, you know, you're going through a procedure, for example, you can have uh, unforeseen, you know, like uh, a heart rate goes up, you know, things like that, where it's still difficult to do with. I, I agree with you. There is use, to, use for that. But there still is <clears throat> still is use for the VR. Okay. Uh, in fact, I, I think I I could uh, tell you something against this approach. This approach is finite. It gives you only prefix scenarios, so you cannot really uh, model all the possible 
uh, interactions that will occur. Okay, so uh, you have a set of fixed scenarios, you learn the scenario, but you don't know how you will react if something unexpected happens. So it's a limitation of the approach to only record prefix scenarios. But I have also uh, a, a bad example uh, in which I'm involved, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> to, to point out something else. Uh, that some, uh, and the something else is that the technology sometimes uh, impresses you uh, yep. without having anything behind it. And I, of course, I don't mean anything. Oh, no, I, I agree with you. I, I completely uh, agree with you. I'll give you first the, the bad exa example, and then I'll ask the question. The bad example that I was involved with was mid-80s in the University of Toronto, mm -hmm. where we had uh, a good group, uh, one of the leading groups in office, office automation. Yeah. Completely irrelevant with games or whatever else. But games was a word that was playing in our ears. Mm -hmm. And sometime when we were when searching for documents, we decided, well, let's put some gaming in it. So we designed the interface with the students implemented it. And, uh, the, the students essentially were shooting down the document, etc. It looked impressive <laughs> for a month yep. or two. And then, of course, it was thrown out because it's too slow, it becomes boring, whatever else you want. So, something that can be impressive in terms of uh, using the technology, etc., yep. may not be. So, the question here is that um, in all those, uh, all this discussion that we have about learning. Uh, with uh, virtual reality and uh, medical applications. Uh, what kind of evaluation about the learning yeah, that you so, achieve you have? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's actually a, a very good question because that's one of the problems, One, or, I mean it's changing, that's one of the problems with many of these tools that have been developed, they haven't been evaluated properly for learning. Um, a lot of them, uh, if you look at a lot of the the, the, the studies, I mean, it's changing now, but nonetheless, um, you look at, they evaluate the user interface, they do some things, it's fun, this, that, some questionnaires. But in terms of doing an actual study where you're looking at learning outcomes, um, that's gonna be done, it's done in the traditional way um, as, you know, physical simulation is with a pre and post testing type scenario. Um, so we've, we've done some work with that. It becomes very difficult to do that with, med with medical folks folks, because you're looking at, it's very difficult to get, you know, groups of, of trainees and, and what have you, but you can do that, but then you're looking at very small sample sizes, um, that becomes an issue, and that's become an issue with journal articles that we've written, and you have a sample size of, size of five, and, you know, like, hey, you know, that's flag, um, you can argue that and, and, and what have you, but it's very difficult to do that, but, but you have to, I mean, anything you develop, you have to show that it's effective. Um, or in order to, to, to use it, at least in medicine, there, there's no, and it takes you know, many, many studies, but it, there's a pre and post testing type of, of, of uh, evaluation that happens in no different than what they do for their traditional simulation approaches. Um, and that, myself, I, I work with others, medical experts, that actually devise these studies, because that's their, their expertise. But yeah, um, but there, but it is, um, there is, you know, as time as we move on, I mean, there is, there are more and more studies that are actually more, you know, carefully thought out studies that are being done to actually look at this. Um, and back in the in the eighties, or there was a whole bunch of meta analysis that were done that looked at the effectiveness of serious games, and I mean, the U.S. Army did some some big work in this, and what they found was that, and again, this is going back a number of a couple of decades or. 15, 20 years ago, what they found was uh, there was a study by Hayes, um, and he found that most of them are not effective, um, and they're not doing what they intend to do, but he attributed that to the lack of design, lack of design. It's not to say that game-based learning is, is not effective as a whole, it's just these things have to be properly designed, which they weren't, or they weren't being done, uh, they weren't prop really looking at the, the outcomes and, and the instructional component to it. Um, I think now as we become more aware of that, things are, are, are starting to change. But yeah, we need more evidence. 
because these medical applications are not actually incorporated in the medical training. These are more of the research. Very few, I mean, yeah, very, very few. Um, we've done some where they've actually given some of the, but yeah, it's not a core part of the curriculum. But it's moving into that into that domain. But again, in order for it to do that, there has to be a lot of evidence, um, and you need a lot of you got to run through it. It's not easy to get it incorporated. Um, what they're doing with a lot of the stuff is, um, you know, you can you or, or the, the stuff that I'm aware of. You can you know, if, you know the, the the surgeon who has the trainees, and they look at the game, they look at the app, and they'll give it to their students, for example. But yeah, it's not wide scale. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, I was wondering, um, do the tools that you have, like Unreal and Unity, are they suitable for this kind of work, or do you need to yeah. do them? Um, so all the stuff that we've done, for the most part, um, is all done in Unity. It's actually done in Unity. And the nice thing about Unity is that, well, it's, it's, there's a lot of resources and a lot of, it's widely used. Um, but the nice thing is that, the, I mean, there's toolboxes for everything, like the haptic devices, the, the Oculus, the, the Vive, there's all kinds of plugins. and. So it's pretty well, anything we need, we do with Unity. Yeah. I have one student that refuses to use Unity. He created his own engine, and I don't know why, but yeah, he just wanted to. Yes, um, back on the subject um, that um, the other student upgrades before, could we maybe um, do a simulation on making people um, react better to unpredictability? Maybe to sorry to surprise to maybe, uh, maybe doctors are react better um, to anxiety stress un unpredictable stuff that happens yep. because the human factor is unpredictable. So that's the nice thing about simulation is that you can actually train for these events that don't happen that are rare that rarely occur in the real world. Um, just as an example, um, so you can I mean that's. There could be cases or certain um, symptoms or, or, or diseases that a doctor probably won't see, you know, perhaps even in the span of their career. But you can actually simulate them in, in the in, in the VR world. Um, and the other thing, in terms of, um, you know, when you're looking at anxieties and the element of surprise, they're they're actually used like exposure therapy is, is an example where you're using VR and, and gaming like scenarios to acquaint people with things that they fear, like also, heights um, and. Could we could we maybe like are the simulations being done about other sciences like maybe like simulate a business meeting for oh, yeah, yeah. or economics yep. or yep. maybe even an electronics lab for us? Yep. So so there's actually like IBM for example has done has used um, they've used a lot of gaming um, technologies um, and, and games to train um, their consultants um, on business etiquette. You know how to actually I, I did some work with them that. I received some money for them to develop a game for cultural competence. So training their consultants on how to conduct, uh, you know, proper business meeting etiquette for doing, uh, you know, for meetings overseas with Chinese or, or Japanese, how to shake hands, how to greet them, and, and that type of thing. Absolutely. Um, electronic labs, there's actually, there's a number of, of um, games out there yeah. for engineering and that type of thing. You can find a simulator on circuits, for example, online, but it's really hard to, I don't know, incorporate that into school, like in class, for my professor, something that we all do. Yep, so, so again, that has to come from yeah. proper design of the game for one thing, but also it has to be incorporated into the curriculum. And that's, that's actually a really good point. Um, you know, you have the game, you've developed it, you've shown that it's effective, assuming you can do that and, and it's all perfect, it has to be incorporated into the curriculum. So then you have to consider, how is it going to be incorporated into the curriculum? How much time do they have to, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, there's many answers, or many issues that have to be considered. Good point. Any more questions? I think we should thank Gabriel for giving us this talk, and please come down to talk to him if you want to. Uh, Who's gonna go play games now? <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah, 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 maybe, maybe yeah.